On the 21st of February, 1975, the Polish audience saw a premiere of the movie, The Promised Land. Directed by Andrzej Wider, it became the greatest anti-capitalist movie of all time, and it remains one of the best movies ever produced in Poland. What historical context was behind the movie, and what made it so successful? The answers to these and other questions, you will find out in this documentary. To get a better understanding of the motifs and sentiments embedded in this movie, we need to understand the perspective of Vladislav Raymond. He was the author of the novel of the same name, which became the foundation of Wider's cinematic work. The Promised Land became a popular novel, but the most successful Raymond's work, The Peasants, was published five years later. Shortly before his death in 1925, the Polish writer was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Like many contemporary writers and painters, Raymond had a great admiration for the rural scenery and its environment. The hard daily labor, the everyday life of peasants, and their devotion to folk traditions and religion, became an inspiration to dozens of visual and literary works. The rural scenery presented a strong contrast to the cities, which were going through industrialization and a rapid increase in population. Raymond's admiration towards peasants helped the writer to leave a bright mark in the history of literature. The idea of the Promised Land novel was impacted by this sympathy towards the peasantry and Raymond's personal experiences in Lodz. During his stay in this rapidly growing industrial city, the writer saw how the city and its population are transforming. The title The Promised Land was kind of ironic, because it had biblical references. Lodz indeed became a place where the masses were heading with a clear ambition to make a fortune in this industrial paradise. Contrary to the biblical version, Raymond witnessed all the capitalist realities that changed the lives of a small group of people for good. At the same time, this rise of capitalism, without any mercy, crushed the dreams of hard-working people who worked and lived in miserable conditions. The system of values was more cynical and money-driven than in the rural areas. A hard-working peasant worshipped God, while a hard-working merchant worshipped money. As you can guess, Raymond had no sympathy for such a philosophy. The Promised Land takes us back to the mid-1880s. At the time, Lodz was a part of the Russian Empire and already a blooming industrial center. It was a multi-ethnic city inhabited by Poles, Jews, Germans, and Russians. Located in the Pyotrkov Governorate, Lodz went through major changes in the first half of the 19th century. In the early 1800s, the population of Lodz was just a few hundred inhabitants. It was a small and quiet town, compared to its later version. The course of its history changed in 1820, when Prince Josef Zajacek signed a document that initiated the development of the textile industry in Lodz. The concept of the promised land was born. The town was transformed into a city, and the most rapid pace of industrialization happened between 1830 and 1872. The population during this period grew from 4,000 to 100,000 inhabitants. By 1900, Lodz had a population of 300,000. Ambitious merchants and workers migrated to this industrial paradise. During the growth of the city, there appeared the term Lodzemensch. It was used to distinguish the local, successful part of the population. Ironically, the Poles themselves did not enjoy much success and lion's share of the wealth was in the hands of Germans and Jews. Raymond based the story on the journey of three young and ambitious friends. The Polish nobleman and director of a textile factory, Karol Borowiecki. His good friend, 
a son of a German factory owner, Max Baum, and a local Jewish entrepreneur, Moritz Welt. All three of them are good friends since their studies at the university in Riga, and their common goal is to earn enough money to build their own factory. This trio was a good example of the coexistence of different nations and cultures when there was a common goal in front of them. Their characters differ a lot, but the desire to join the elites of Lodz helps to put the differences aside. Then there are the millionaires, the factory and bank owners of Lodz. A German millionaire and the wealthiest man in the city is Hermann Buchholz, an ill-tempered man who despises working-class people. Müller is another German millionaire, but unlike Buchholz, he is a simple and hard-working man. Instead of living in his luxury palace, Müller resides in a humble house nearby his factory. Then there is Robert Kessler. He is a young German owner of a factory, who enjoys forcing his female workers to take part in parties organized in Kessler's villa. Another representative of the Lord's elite is Zucker, a Jew who owns a factory and enjoys the company of his beautiful wife at social events. Another influential member of the Lord's society is Grossley, a Jewish banker who owns a bank and knows well where to invest the money. He is a very greedy character who tries to save money in every way possible. There are three main female characters all in one or another way, tied to the leading character, Carol. Anka is his fiancée. She is a good-hearted, young woman, willing to help people in need. She loves Carol sincerely and truly wants to marry him. However, Anka is unaware of Carol's romantic affair with the wife of Zucker, Lucy. She is very passionate about being with him, and the movie emphasized on this a lot. Another woman, who is fond of Carol is Mada, the daughter of millionaire Muller. Her interest in Carol is sincere, and her father feels sympathetic toward the choice of the daughter. Throughout the story, the attitude of Carol against these three women changes. Despite all the romantic buzz around him, the leading character keeps focused on his ambitious plan to build a factory with his friends. Raymond described Lodz very realistically, emphasizing the harsh naturalism and tough realities of the people who tried to survive in this industrial city. Realism was also added by basing the novel characters on real-life prototypes. For example, the character of Karol Borowetsky was inspired by an ambitious chemist and a friend of Raymond, Jan Snihowski. Some contemporaries considered him the pioneer of the dye industry in Poland. He became a successful entrepreneur in the city of Sierz, which is located nearby Lodz, and his charismatic personality caught the attention of Raymond. The rich and influential entrepreneurs of Lodz were also inspired by real-life prototypes. The city was constantly buzzing and growing, and for highly creative writer as Raymond, it was a great environment to observe and take notes of. Ambitious men, such as Ludwig Geyer, Israel Poznansky and Karol Scheibler, became the inspiration for the characters of Buchholz, Kessler, and others. But unlike the modern-day world, where wealth and success are highly regarded, Raymond was not an admirer of millionaires. He saw what this cruel pursuit of wealth caused for the ordinary people around Lodz. Still, the storyline in the novel was less harsh and cynical than its cinematic version. Andrzej Wider took the story and emphasized the most despicable sides of the capitalist system. The never-ending greed of people, the cult of wealth, and the desire to earn it by all means possible. Of course, since Poland was under communism rule at the time, there were added some socialist undertones in this movie. However, those weren't really supported by Wider himself. There were some interesting nuances in the production of the promised land that should be explained. 
Wider had painful, personal reasons to dislike the communist regime, imposed on Poland by the Soviet Union after World War II. Wider's father, Jakub, was one of thousands of Polish officers, who were murdered during the Katyn massacre in 1940. His anti-communist sentiments were on a display, later in Wider's career. The Man of Marble, and its sequel, The Man of Iron, became a brilliant, semi-documentary cinematic gems, that shed light on the struggle of the Polish nation under communism. The latter was a sign of support for the Solidarity Movement, that was born after a series of massive worker strikes in August 1980. Considering the tense political situation in Poland at the time, such a movie was a dangerous idea to work on. Wider took the risk and faced consequences afterward, being forced to work in exile. To get permission to make The Man of Marble, Wider had to be very patient. It took 15 years to make it happen. The idea to make this movie, first came up in 1962, when he heard the story of Piotr Ozanski, a real-life Stahanovitz who became a prototype of Burkut's character. However, at the time, it was impossible to direct a movie that criticizes the government and its ideology. Wider earned some favor from the Ministry of Culture, only after the release of The Promised Land. State censorship was something that film directors had to deal with regularly, in the Eastern Bloc countries. At the time, Wider and his colleagues, had to find ways, how to trick the censors to avoid the reality, of their original ideas being overly edited. The cinema was not a commercial industry, and it was state-controlled. Censors and influential political figures decided, what movies the audience is going to see, and what movies will never see a daylight. Artists of all sorts, had to maneuver through these circumstances, and Wider was no exception. The Promised Land was an excellent chance, to create a cinematic adaptation that would appeal to the government's taste. The biggest enemy for the communists, was the capitalist system, and a display of the most despicable sides of it, was worthy of support. While the novel wasn't intended as a political manifesto, Wider added a strong emphasis on the working-class struggle. As you might guess, the working-class people were the backbone of every communist state. Wider showed a dark contrast between the rich and the poor. The viewer in the cinema could observe, how the characters lose their human side, in a cold pursuit of wealth. The promised land became a win-win situation for both sides. Censorship and propaganda machine got a quality movie, that fit the ideological narratives, and Wider got a ticket, to make a more rebellious movies. The release of The Promised Land, became kind of a turning point in his career. One of the things the movie earned praise for, was the authentic atmosphere and sights, of the late 19th century lots. Thankfully for Wider and the filming crew, the two world wars did not destroy some of the finest industrial and residential buildings in the city. Since the necessary buildings remained untouched, the viewer could enjoy authentic scenes, of the dark and gloomy factory buildings, where the workers sought their promised land. The filming process began in February, and was finished in June, so viewers can see some truly dystopian and depressive shots throughout the movie. Grey skies and streets, and a heavy atmosphere of hopelessness. Wider could also easily display a stark contrast, displaying the luxury apartments of the Lod's millionaires. The beautiful palaces of Israel and Karol Poznansky, and Karol Scheibler, can be seen in the movie. Among the other locations where some of the scenes were filmed, was the small village of Krasho. It is located 25 kilometers from Lodz. The scenes with Borowetsky's family manor in Kurau, were filmed in this location. The manor is surrounded by calming sights of nature, 
seen in the opening sequence of the movie. The work on the design of costumes was also done with great accuracy. When you watch how the characters are dressed, you can easily distinguish their social status, and sometimes, even their ethnic background. Especially, when it comes to the wealthiest citizens of Lodz. The scenes, displayed at the theatre, were a symbolic showcase of all the nobles, millionaires, and ambitious entrepreneurs, like Borowiecki, Baum, and Welt. The eccentric trio also takes notice, and points it directly to the viewer, during the spectacle in theatre. They speak about the large amounts of money the Lord's millionaires own, and how expensive diamonds they purchase for their wives. Money is what drives life around the city. It's the dream, goal, and obsession of Lodz. No matter what social class we think of. While the overall reaction from the audience was positive, due to its dynamic and realistic depiction of late 19th century capitalism, some criticism and controversy arose abroad. Wider himself, hoped that the promised land will earn recognition in the United States. The hopes were crushed soon, after there appeared a critical review in the French newspaper. It portrayed the promised land as an anti-Semitic work. Unfortunately for Wider, this anti-Semitic label was soon picked up and promoted by American critics, and no one wanted to let this movie appear in American cinemas. In modern-day terms, the movie was cancelled. Foreign movie critics lacked any understanding of Polish history and its 19th century realities, and they showed no interest in researching this topic. Or maybe, it was simply a disgust towards the idea of a display of an anti-capitalist movie. For people who lived in this greed-driven system, the promised land was too of a truth-telling movie. And as we know, the truth is often ugly and unpleasant to acknowledge. With all its harsh naturalism, the movie does not favor any nationality. There are positive and negative characters from different ethnic backgrounds, and labeling The Promised Land as an anti-Semitic movie was totally absurd, to say the least. Wider depicts all the odds, the misery of the working class, and the fade of national sentiments, in favor of profit. The portrayal of Borowiecki is a fine example. The Polish nobles, historically were known for being proud, of their ancestry and heritage. The promised land shows a clear disregard for the past. It's the 19th century, but you can already see, how the temptation of becoming a millionaire, makes people abandon their traditions. To achieve his goals, Borowiecki is willing to sacrifice dignity, the house of his forefathers, and his human side. This is a fine example, of the never-ending greed that haunts humanity. The leading character is already a successful man, earning well and being highly regarded in lots. But it's not enough. It is never enough, for these kind of people. Ironically, all the displayed harsh realities, are as actual nowadays, as 150 years ago. The Promised Land presents a timeless perspective, on the decadence of human nature, under a certain ideology. Nothing much has changed. The working class people remain underpaid, and forced to do their job in terrible conditions, in the majority of countries around the globe. Western countries have reached a certain level of stability, but the lion's share of the wealth, remains in the hands of a small percentage of people. The greedy elites never lost their thirst for power and status. If you want an honest, and slightly misanthropic guide through the cult of capital, the promised land is a perfect choice. You won't find a more vivid, yet accurate depiction of the rapid industrialization process. The movie is dynamic enough, to keep the viewer's attention for almost three hours, and it brings genuine, conflicting emotions which is one of the key elements, in the evaluation of a movie. 
Wider probably did not intend it as deep and multi-layered, as the movie eventually turned out to be. There is a great literary work behind the scenario, masterful direction by one of the cinematic geniuses, and a large cast of charismatic actors. And most importantly, it wasn't produced as a commercial cinema. Everyone involved in the production of The Promised Land was driven by a genuine desire to present a quality, cinematic work. As long as capitalism will live on, the story depicted in the movie will remain actual. The exploitation of hard-working people is a timeless issue. Unfortunately, it will always exist. The Promised Land can serve as a refreshing reminder of how this cult of capital became so wild and unstoppable. If you haven't seen this movie yet, it's a must-see cinematic work. It will raise questions, it will give you the answers on the way, and you will see capitalism, as it is. Ruthless, and unforgiving. If you enjoy this kind of content, be sure to click the like and subscribe buttons. If you want to support our visual guides and documentaries about history, art, and cinema, visit our page on Ko-Fi. Thank you for watching.